Okay. Well, Michelle, why don't we hand it off to you? And looking forward to learning more today. Okay. Do you want to bring Marty in and take that picture first, or do you want me to start? Sure. Let's do that. Marty, how you doing? Marty, thanks. If you don't mind, we're going to take... Everybody already smiled once, so this is kind of unusual, but we were going to ask them to smile a second time and take a picture if that's okay by you. Not hearing you. Not hearing you. He's showing off his shirt. Okay, you have to read the shirt. You can read the shirt. In fact, Michelle knows how to transcribe that shirt, but... <laughs> Is is this the class photo right now? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, stand fast, please. Okay. All right. That's great, Marty. Everyone's got to make a statement. That's mine. Michelle, all yours. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Don. I'm going to begin today by first giving you guys some background on me um, and my background and why I'm interested in why I was interested in taking this course, Hamming on Hamming, Learning to Learn. Essentially, there's a lot of parallels between Hamming's life and mine, or at least I found that there has been. I'm a 26 year Army veteran. My early career was in communication networks and information technology. You know, I tell my mom that I was basically AT&T for the Army, uh, going where there's no communications and bringing in the switches and equipment necessarily necessary to allow people to communicate. I'm also a lifelong learner. In fact, my degrees are spaced 22 years apart. Earned a bachelor's degree in applied math um, in 1994 from the United States Military Academy. Followed that up 10 years later with a master's degree in applied math from Western Michigan University. And then 12 years after that, just recently in 2016, earned a PhD in computational science and informatics, and I like to call doing math with computers. So I have the same applied mathematics or a very similar applied mathematics background and that, that Hamming does. Over the course of the 26 years of my military career, I've also been fortunate enough to spend eight of those years teaching at the undergraduate and the graduate school level as well. I've taught courses in calculus, engineering mathematics, numerical analysis, military information technology, statistics, data analysis, and design of experiments. So I have a, you know, touched a lot of these topics that we've been touching as well. And so I really was excited to take this course because now at the point where I'm transitioning from my military career to what we call career 2.0. And as I leave the military, and, it, and actually I'm going to leave my time in academia as well, I'm going to kind of do the reverse of what Hamming did. I'm going to now go out and see what industry has to offer as I move out. And so I thought this course would give me a good opportunity to not only learn, and I've learned a whole lot, but to also reflect on where I've been and how to best prepare for my next adventure in the healthcare industry. So that's the background. I also like to, as we go through each of these sections, I like to take time to really look at what Hamming predicted back in 1993 you know, to 95 in that time frame, and kind of see where we are today. And then also think about, so where are we gonna be in 2020? 2055, 25 years from now, you know, and, and, and could we even come close to predicting what that might look like? Okay, so now we will go to the first lecture today is going to be lecture 21, fiber optics. Okay, and I'm not necessarily going to go through all of the slides. I will try to tell you what slide I've jumped to if you are, in fact, wanting to follow along with the slides. But since we have four lectures to cover today, I'm going to maybe hop around just a little bit. So the first one is on fiber optics. And I think the overall theme for this section is 
that famous Louis Pasteur quote that uh, Hamming often refers to, luck favors the prepared mind. And so Hamming didn't have any background or real experience with fiber optics. It came up as one of those lectures or a seminar that they were given on a new technology that was coming out. And Hamming even had to stop to ponder, should he go to this lecture or not, as we often do with seminars and things like that. We often have to ask ourselves, do we really have time for this or should we be doing something else? But one of the things that Hamming mentions in his lecture is that, you know, you have to be able to discern when, when there is a talk that has an impact. And um, in the case of fiber optics, this was a new technology that he knew a little bit about, definitely not an expert in. And he, he tells the students during the lecture that, you know, there's, there's basically five questions you need to ask, you know, what should you be looking for? What should you watch for? What should ignore? What kind of things should you keep abreast of? What to ponder? And really for me, I think, is really how do you prepare for this, the implementation of this new technology and what impacts will it have on the future? And even more so, how does that, how will the future of that technology impact you, your career, and your kind of immediate surroundings? All right, so remembering that um, Hamming's giving this talk and actually wrote his lecture notes probably around 1993, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is where, what was the state of technology in 1993? And so fiber optic cables were just being developed. And they figured out how to armor them so that they could safely be run over if, if necessary. They would, had just started to be used to guide missiles in flight. And then there were many obvious applications in the Navy and the Air Force, mainly by replacing copper wires with these fiber optic cables, which would allow them to potentially save space. And as we know, based on surface ships and in aircraft frames, anything that might reduce weight or save space are technologies that were sought after at that time. Next slide, please. The transoceanic trans cables were just being, starting to be put in across the oceans. Hamming had talked about also that he had envisioned in the future there would be a, a rimming of each of the continents in fiber optics and a branching off of these fiber optic cables and, and bringing connectivity to places all across the globe. He also believed that in the long run, the dominant methods would be solitons, not pulses. And he cautioned his students that they should keep abreast of these technologies. Next slide, please. This is just a quick slide showing the differences between the soliton pulse and the linear pulse. The difference, the biggest difference was that the soliton doesn't have this dispersion to the uh, pulse, it actually maintains its shape, shape over long distances. Next slide. Continuing this theme of kind of looking at fiber optics and trying to figure out how do we prepare for what fiber optics could do for us in the future, Hamming spent some time thinking about how will fiber optics impact the design of a computer? He knew that computers would, would be interconnected, and in 1993, there were computers that, that were being connected by fiber optics. But he thought, you know, well, why wouldn't we push this forward and have fiber optics also be part of the interning, internal wiring and, and maybe even part of the motherboard? Next slide. His thought was, and his idea was, could we not, in some t given time to develop it, make optical chips and, and then avoid all of the wiring of the power distribution? And the reason this would be important is because if you can do it with light, 
you don't get the massive heat that that is really one of the major problems that has been in, in computers since computers started being made is how do we you know keep the components inside of the computer cool right and so we've had fans and all kinds of things but really that was the idea was can we replace the wiring inside a chip with light beams next slide please okay and this was his idea of just putting some sort of photo cell on a circuit next slide and then this was kind of the idea of what he thought might it might look like if the chips were connected by optical beams next slide So here's, once again, he's still kind of looking forward and thinking, can we cheapen the price of computers? Can we, you know, can we have these optical, can op these optical technologies be used to, to, in the crossbar switches? Will it make a more effective and efficient computer design? And then, you know, once again, just him sitting in, thinking and kind of being prepared for what might come next. Next slide. Okay, and so this gets to what I think was actually his theme throughout this entire lecture, which is if you anticipate what changes are going to come rather than sitting passively by, you're always going to be ahead of uh, the changes in technology. Next slide. You know, and he didn't mention you can't lead everywhere, you know, but you, you should, so you should have an idea of what is the technology in your field and not be left behind by the developments that relate most to you and to your field. Okay. And really he's pushing, obviously, the leaders in, that he had in his classroom here at the Naval Postgraduate School to be leaders in their, in, in their field. Next slide. Okay. And so then his prediction was that, and this is, you know, this is the Verizon Fios point where he felt that all of the drop lines would, from the streets to the house, would, would soon be fiber optics in the very near future. And then you'd be able to have all of these different services brought into you through that one through that one cable essentially and then you'd have a digital filter that would then allow you to have the different types of services and as you know we have the ability through one fiber cable to have internet phone and tv through these service providers Although there are still a lot of places, even in the United States, that are without fiber. And so satellite technologies still do exist from the perspective of, you know, broadcasting and broadband. You know, that was one of the things he also mentioned during his lecture was that, you know, satellites are for broadband and fiber optics allow you to now have this more private communications without using what was, you know, in the previous, previous to fiber optics, satellites were being used to do private type communications. And so it, it changes the ability of people to talk as well and communicate. Next slide. Okay. And so then as he wraps up the, the, at the very end of the lecture, he basically says, you know, the technology is one thing, but then you also have to consider what are the political, economic, and social conditions, and will it in fact be able to be implemented? You know, will, you know, will society allow one company to bundle TV, voice, and internet services all together? You know, will, can, will this in fact be allowed to happen 
or would it be considered a monopoly and you know those kind of things so so that was kind of how he he concluded this and now if we can go back to the lecture page i would like to take a look at today's lecture and i do have a couple discussion questions that i prepared that i'd like to talk about okay there we go okay so on today's lecture for fiber optics um, at the bottom of the page we will find essentially an interesting uh, kind of summary or a quick summary of what we just discussed but what i highlighted here these six bullets are those predictions um, that Hamming made back in 1995 for the future of fiber optics and the question that i would pose and and would ask you to think about is you know how accurate or inaccurate were Hamming's predictions which items were developed and which items are still maybe on the horizon. And then what ideas do you have for the next generation of fiber optic technologies? Where are we going next? And so I would open that up for a class discussion. If anybody has any thoughts on fiber optics and being prepared for new technologies. Or can you copy them to the chat? Because the chat window can be overlapped. And I would like to start sharing my thoughts on this one. Um, I think um, Hemming was pretty accurate when it comes to the general technique of transmitting data to homes. Um, but I think um, the digital subscriber line technique, DSL, was something that came up in the 2000s. And he wasn't aware of that. So the old, we call a telephone wire, the two wire connection to our houses, um, he thought of would be dead someday is actually used to distribute um, the endpoints so we don't have fiber to the home at least not everywhere and we use a digital subscriber line the old two wire technique to get the data from the last distribution point we call it the last mile um, into the home um, for distribution so a technique that was close to dead uh, actually survived and we did some revolution to it. Uh, not, not evolution, it was a revolution and still using it with uh, speeds Hemming couldn't imagine uh, 25 years ago. Cool, thank you. I kind of counter some of what Toby said with the two copper line, you know, old school phone lines. A lot of that's just legacy systems because of in the Western world, it's required by federal mandate that every home be connected to the national infrastructure. And that was what's been connected. So I think, I mean, if we go another 10 years forward, as new properties are being developed, some of those laws may change. And we're seeing it in the developing world in Africa, where they didn't have that infrastructure. And now they've, they've, they've jumped a generation and everything's wireless. So I think we might see that fall away and then the national backbone you know the the, the backbone of the internet remains as uh, you know copper and fiber marty's got something uh thanks uh i'm in one of the cities i'm in falls church virginia about uh, four miles from the pentagon and we're fiber to the home my the, my fiber wiper my my fiber line comes all the way into my comms utility cabinet where it goes into a single gateway and then i've got gigabit throughout my house and if i was crazy enough or could imagine what the need is i could have 10 to 100 gig verizon will sell you 10 gig fiber all the way into your house in fact when they put in the fiber they cut the wire, by the way, that was called POTS. Plain old telephone system was the copper wire was called POTS. They cut it and pulled it down. The only thing I have connected to my house related to communications, Michelle at all, is fiber and 240 volt, 200 amp power. So it's changing and in some parts of the world, 
it's changing very fast. But as in the middle of the United States and Arkansas, Louisiana, I'm sure there's areas where DSL and pushing what they can or a used uh, satellite system where you can get 5, 10, 20 meg is, is the thing. And Elon Musk is dropping LEO, low earth orbit satellites, to try to give everyone a, a 100 meg. Yeah, we it, we've we've come so far, and yet you know we still have a ways to go. And you're right, Marty. When I lived in Northern Virginia, that's exactly right. The fiber optics came right up to the house. But my place in Big Sandy, Tennessee, I'm on HughesNet satellite internet. So, <laughs> um, and the telephone company's AT and T, and they can't even do DSL to the house. So that's just the copper wire providing the phone line. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we've got different, different technologies depending on where you live across even the United States. But that's pretty cool. And then on the bottom of that lecture page, um, the other thing that I did here, and I'll uh, share it one more time, and I encourage each of you to come on and, uh, come on and, and leave your thoughts on this page as well. Um, I did a couple things. The first one is just, you know, you can do this on your own time, but if you want to remember what the internet was like back in 1995, there's a good collection of clips from the Today Show where they're trying to discuss what the internet is and will they even subscribe to it. And it's uh, just for fun and, and a little bit of humor, but it gives you a good idea of at the time that Hamming was giving the lecture, what the state of the internet was. And then, because we talked about the trans, um, the, the undersea cables, I wanted to show, you know, back in 1995, this is about 93 when Hamming was writing this, and then here's 95 when these lectures were recorded, you know, that's how many cables had been uh, pushed across undersea, you know, and you can see even last year, the most cables to ever be installed underwater was last year with 39 of these cables. And, and this chart comes out of this article that you can see right here, the Global Fiber Optic Network Explained. And then I go on to just, once again, for uh, your, your information, link to one more article here where they're actually discussing these photonic integrated circuits, right? So we're, they're finally maybe getting to this idea of an optical circuit or an optical chip. But of course, there's still the problem is that they're still too large to actually be put inside of a PC, if you will, or a computer. And so my, just those are just a couple things that I listed there. And I en encourage you to come and add your comments as well with your thoughts and and things you find as we go. So, okay, Marty, I hear you. Yeah, uh, just, just a 30 second sound bite. Um, most of that fiber that's pulled, first of all, it is thousands of fiber optics mm -hmm. in a cable, and most of it is dark, meaning not currently used. It's like building a 64 lane highway just in case Los Angeles has to leave town. And most of this is monochromatic, white only. Bell Labs way back when said, we can get 255 colors down here. So basically bandwidth is free. Communications is free. Storage is free. I have USBs that indicate to me are two terabyte in a USB. The i10 or i11, I mean, the Intel chip is what, 16 core? Storage is free, compute is free, comms is free with solar energy at 35 to 40% with the new so, uh, so cells. Power is free. What's not? Data. Quality data. Doing a search online and finding here the IEEE Journal of Optical Communications and Networking. Oh, so there's a lot on that. But wait, there's more related magazines and journals. Uh, journal of Lightwave Technology, IEEE Photonics Journal, IEEE Photonics Technology Letters, et cetera, et cetera. 
also did a search on solitons and fiber. So there's a part of the fiber communications write up in Wikipedia. And indeed, there are companies with this in their name. So yeah, it appears to have spread quite a bit. And a, and a footnote, Marty, on what you were saying, the as noble as it sounds, believe it or not, getting 64 gazillabyte fiber capacity is not why they pull multiple fibers when they lay in new infrastructure. And even NPS faced this question maybe a decade ago. The reason why they do it is because the, the major cost is digging up the hole in the ground and they don't want to do that anymore. So they just say, how much, how much can we fit in there? Let's put it all in. Okay, dark fiber. We don't know what yet, but we'll put it in because we're saving money. So the interplay with economics is absolutely fascinating. Okay, 